supporters who come together to uh, seek out life in the Holy Spirit, um, particularly under the patronage of uh, the Apostle Paul. And so we've been really blessed after 2020, returning to um, our life of you know, worshiping with one another, uh, asking the Lord to give us uh, gifts, uh, spiritual gifts. Um, and uh, every time we've been blessed to hear a, a, a wonderful talk. Uh, to edify us and give us an opportunity to take what we receive here and uh, bring it out into our uh, daily lives as seminarians and uh, um, whatever we're doing for our daily life. Um, so once again, thanks for coming uh, this evening. It's a cold one out there, so for everyone who, for everyone who is traveling, uh, I appreciate you I'm making it. Um, and so I, I forgot my notes in the back. That's all right. We're, we're winging it. And um, uh, we'll just give a short uh, introduction for the night, um, and then uh, we'll go from there. But uh, we'll start off with uh, a talk by Peter Herbeck. I'll introduce him in a second. Um, and then we'll take a time of worship, and a bit of an extended time of worship, uh, more than we usually do. Um, and then after that, at about 8 o'clock, we'll, um, we'll take a short break and uh, come back. Or, uh, for some small group prayer time, uh, prayer ministry. And for me personally, I found that those opportunities, praying with uh, a small group after these meetings, that's where the rubber met, you know, meets the road. Uh, that's where uh, the Lord works in a specific, specifically powerful way uh, in, in my own life and I know in you know, many others as well. So um, please, if you're able, stick around for that. I think the Lord really will bless you. So, but without further ado, I want to give a brief introduction for uh, for Peter Herbeck. So he's the uh, director, well, the vice president, uh, off my notes right now, so I'm going from memory, the vice president, director of mm, missions at uh, Renewal Ministries. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. <Nice> yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's a, a world-renowned uh, evangelist, author, speaker. Uh, he's also a parishioner at uh, uh, Christ the King in Ann Arbor. A father, a husband, an alumnus of uh, Sacred Heart Major Seminary. So uh, we're really blessed to have him tonight. Thank you, uh, Peter, for sharing us on uh, with us on courage. He's going to speak uh, about courage uh, in St. Paul's witness. So let's welcome Peter up. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. I hope you're doing well. It's uh, you're working your way through the semester. Pretty soon you're going to be on break. Everybody going home for Thanksgiving? Yes. Yeah. yeah, it should be good. Looking forward to it. So, um, yeah, a little bit more about myself. I am married to a lovely woman named Debbie. We have four children, two boys, two girls. Everybody's out of the house. Three of them are married. Uh, my youngest daughter works with us. She's not yet married. If you know any really great guys, just let me know. You know? Uh, not you guys, but you're right. The, um, uh, we have 10 grandchildren, and uh, most of us all live in this area. One son who lives in St. Paul with her family. Uh, and I, I love coming back here. There's a place back in the 90s uh, that uh, got my master's degree here. And, just had a lot of wonderful memories of this place and uh, ministering here in different ways, but just the people here, great people, 
Um, some of the people who've taught here at Seal Teacher are my really close friends, and uh, I'm grateful for the work that's happening, grateful for you guys being here. So I'm, I'm especially thankful for the topic tonight, talk about courage, um, because I think this is a critical virtue for us to lay hold of and to live in and live out of and begin to expect the Lord to help us to, to live with the courage we need for the moment we live in. We are living in, you guys are moving toward ordination at an unbelievable time in the history of our culture and of the church. It is a time of just sort of un, just incredible, intense spiritual combat. And it's a time of great testing for the church. It's a time of purification for the church. Now, the Lord has the church right there in the palm of his hand. He's got the leaders right in the palm of his hand. But he's allowing a redemptive discipline and a purification to come upon the church. And it's difficult. And it's hard. And, uh, and what he's doing is he's, he's always pruning. You know, his redemptive, Hebrews chapter 12 says that um, God disciplines those whom he loves, right? He said, what did he say? If he didn't discipline you, who were you? He said he disciplines his children. He said if we didn't experience his discipline, we would be orphans. Because he's a good father, and a good father disciplines his children to bring about the peaceful, peaceful fruit of righteousness. And so that's part of what's happening in the church. And so it's an exciting moment to live because the purification is for the glory of the Lord and, the, and his work in our lives to make us saints. But it's for the hour. It's for preparing us, purifying us to be able to bring the gospel with great confidence and clarity and freedom into a world that's desperately, desperately needs it and is literally coming under every day in an ever greater way to the dominion of the powers of this world. The, you know, St. Paul described them, the reign of sin and death, which Jesus broke, right? Remember the devil's strategy, Hebrews chapter two, verse 14. It says this, it says it's the devil's strategy to enslave the human race through the fear of death. This is his strategy, to enslave human beings. And that's what he's done since the fall, right? Why is it, why does he wield the powers of sin and death? He uses death to enslave people into fear. How would you explain that to somebody? If I was a, if you're teaching a class at a local high school, you know, and, and that I bring that passage up and said, what does this mean? The devil enslaves us through fear the fear of death. He's after enslavement, and he has a strategy to get people to be in, in, to live in a condition of slavery, right? So uh, how would you describe it? How do you, how do you understand that dynamic? It's our enemy strategy. What's he doing? Anybody? So Go ahead. People are afraid of death, and so he tries to get them distracted so that they're thinking about anything but death, so it keeps them in the present instead of thinking about yeah, the fear of death is a natural thing in the world, right? We all have it, but then there's the, the reality of spiritual death that really the only thing that, that's ultimately worth being really afraid of is to die in sin, right? That's the ultimate, that's the ultimate death. But human beings, apart from the death and resurrection of Jesus, are subject to powers and those powers are the powers, Scripture, St. Paul says, the, the powers of sin and death. He said, uh, death reigns over us. It's a dominion. It's a disordered energy. It's a power that without the light of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the, the reality of faith, hope, and love at work in us, and hope in particular that sees beyond death in Christ, the new life that we're given, we are going to be, without the help of the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, being baptized into Christ, having the new life within us, we're going to be subject to those powers. What we're seeing in our culture today, Romans chapter 1, St. Paul telling us what, oh yeah, you guys, some of you guys were in that, that Pauline class. What is Romans chapter 1? What is he saying there? He's talking about the wrath of God. Why is the wrath of God coming upon the world that Paul was addressing at the time? What did he say? Because people were doing what? Okay. Now that was that. That's good. That was the consequence 
of the problem. They, the consequence of their sin. What was their sin? What was their fundamental sin? Romans. Idolatry. Idolatry. And how was that idolatry expressed? Mm -hmm. They refused to do what? They, they refused to acknowledge God as God. They refused to give him thanks. And what they do, they suppress the truth about God. Right? That's what Paul said. They, he said they're without excuse. They know God. They know God exists. But they're suppressing the truth about God. And Paul says as a result, you know, God, they, they know God, but they refuse to acknowledge the God that they know because they don't want to serve the God that they know. So they suppress the truth of his rightful authority over us. Right? And so God tries to win them back. But they consciously refuse to acknowledge him as God, Paul says, and to give him thanks. And as a result, they bring themselves under the dominion of sin and death and the dominion of Satan. Right? Because there's only two worlds. There's the kingdom of light and there's the kingdom of darkness. There's no neutral ground. The, our country is now experiencing, we're, we're in the midst of rediscovering something that there's only two kingdoms. And if you leave one king, you leave the kingdom of God and you create a vacuum, that vacuum is going to get filled. It's going to get filled by the gods. It's going to get filled by dark powers. It's going to get filled by the powers of sin and death. And the dominion of death starts coming. Again, over people. One of the ways you see it in our culture, Father Francis Martin used to teach here on occasion. Great, great biblical scholar. He said, he said this, you know, that um, he said you can tell, remember John St. John Paul II used to talk a lot about the culture of death, right? A culture of death is rising. What's a culture? A culture is the way of life of a people. It's what a people value. It's what they honor. It's what they pattern their life after, right? And he said, uh, there's, there's a change that's happening. A culture of, of life is giving way because people are suppressing the truth about God. Their minds are becoming darkened and they're thinking they're creating a culture that's gonna lead them to freedom and happiness and all the rest. And as a result, they're, they're coming under the dominion of the power of, of death without even thinking about it. No one's saying, hey, I'm gonna go choose the dominion of death. That's why I'm going this way. No, they're believing a lie about God, that God is not good, and that I can't be happy if I have to live by these rules and by a, a God who tells me what to do. I want to be free and happy and liberated, so I'm going my own way. And my own way is the way to freedom and safety. But when you make that turn away from God, you disconnect yourself from the ground of reality, of truth, of being, and living under God's grace, even. Even the pagans Paul was addressing there initially in Romans was to say they knew the light, through, through the light of reason, they knew something about God. And if they lived according to what they knew, they would be under blessing, even if they didn't know fully the true God. But if you step out of that, you turn in without understanding. You've turned back toward darkness because you've just turned your back on the truth. And so what happens is God tries, Paul says, God tries to bring us back, to win us back. And if people don't pay attention, he finally moves from, um, you know, mercy to severe mercy. He does whatever needs to be done to awaken, awaken people, right? And so what does Paul do? He said he gives them over to their darkened mind. Their senseless minds became darkened, he said, right? Because they refused the light. To, to, to reject God is to reject the ground of light, all being. And, and what do we often say? That to know the truth is to receive the light of something. Truth is just the revelation of being itself, right? God's being and to know the truth. And so our minds are lightened. So if you suppress it, you deny the truth and you turn toward a darkened world. And then what happens is, this is the whole point, this is kind of an introduction, this is the whole, the whole point of this is that when you turn away from the truth and you turn toward darkness, whether you're just happily trying to pursue freedom or not, you're going to bring yourself under the subjection to the spiritual powers that are present and they are and, and basically under the demonic strategy of the enemy, they wield the power of death. So. Uh, Father Francis used to say, you can tell when a culture it, uh, becomes a culture of death. 
its way of life. He said, when death becomes the solution to the culture's most intractable problems. How do I, you know, look, look what we just voted in in Michigan. These, these unbelievable, like no limit approach to abortion. Why is that? And all, all, do you notice all the commercials are fear-based? They're gonna take away this, they're gonna, you know, I, I don't have freedom over my body and everybody's afraid and everybody's afraid, right? So what am I gonna do? I have to have the power. If I'm gonna be free, if I'm gonna be happy, I have to have the power over my body. I have to have total power over my body that even if, even if I decide that this baby that's inside me is an obstacle to my freedom and my happiness, I have to have the right to be able to, to kill this baby. Otherwise I can't be free. That's a culture of death. That's a great deception, and it's everywhere in our culture today. People believe that. I can't be happy, I can't be free, unless I can take this life. Well, now, what does courage have to do with this? Well, they're under the dominion of darkness, and they're afraid, right? And they think the way out, the way to freedom, is to, without even thinking, they're not thinking, gee, Hmm, what I'm sensing is that the devil's coming after me and his darkness is now upon me because I'm living in fear and I'm afraid to do No, they're not thinking that way. But they are under the dominion of darkness. And as the Lord said, your, the, the, your light becomes darkness. And he said, if, if darkness is your light, how blind can you be? So you slowly come under greater and greater dominion. That's not enough just to take the life of your children. What about your grandparents who are old and senile and they're draining your income? What's happening up in Canada? I mean, in Canada, they just the whole this, was it in um, Ottawa? This official panel of sciences, scientists and doctors proposed to the government to say, we should have a law that allows in the first year of life, if a child has got various kinds of handicaps, for us to be able to kill that child. Why? Well, here we go again. We've got now a handicapped child who's kind of blowing up our plans for our life it's costly, it's demanding, it's difficult, it's hard, that child, and I'm being diminished, and, I, and I'm out of control, I can't control, and I can't secure my, my freedom and my comfort and my happiness, so I should, how do I deal with that problem? Kill the baby. How do I deal with grandma and grandpa that are draining my income, right? Well, you know, you, you've lived long enough, mom and dad, you know, right now, Dad, I mean, your, your, your quality of life. And of course, when you're older and you're sickly, the, oftentimes parents feel bad, like they're, they're um, making life difficult for their children. And stuff. So they, part of the spiritual battle they go through and the emotional battle. And the culture is saying, yeah, you know what? You know what's best for you? We could put on some music. We could like dim the lights. We could get, you know, some of your favorite people here and we'll give you a pill and you can go away. It's legal in Canada. It's legal all, all over the Western world, various places, right? It's rising. Why is it happening? Because people are saying, this is the road to happiness. This is the road to freedom. It's going to make everything better if we can do this. All the troubles in our family and the weight and the discouragement and the sickness and the suffering, it's going to solve all those problems. So those are the big problems in human life. And what's the answer to culture of death? Kill somebody. Violate the fifth commandment. Right? Now, that's, that's, I'm going to ask this question. I'm going to talk a little bit more now directly about um, Paul and about courage. How many of you guys have ever read this little book by Joseph Pieper? First, let me ask you guys know who Joseph Pieper is. You study him here? I mean, he's the best, I think he's the best Catholic philosopher and teaching on virtues I've ever seen. I mean, if you've ever read, I've read a lot of guys, but he's, it's a simple little book called The Brief Reader on the Virtues of the Human Heart. And he basically is building all this on the teaching of Aquinas. And this part of what I'm going to share is a little bit, a little bit um, academic, not too academic for you guys, but it's just more academic maybe for this Friday night prayer meeting. I don't know what you guys normally have, but I just want to do a little bit here because it's very helpful in understanding uh, courage from a Catholic point of view. So, virtue. Tell me, what is virtue, you guys? What's virtue? How do you define virtue? How, how would you define it? Anybody? Alex is working on it. He's got his right there. Stable disposition. Yeah. That is... Uh... 
They choose the good. That's good. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Here's Pieper. Virtue is the utmost of what a man can be. It's the realization of the human capacity for being. I love that definition. I could tell that like moved your hearts deeply. But anyway. <laughs> but here's, what he, here's, his, here's his point that he builds the whole book on. This is really good. He said, Thomas Aquinas, the great teacher of Western Christianity, endeavored to express the Christian image of man in seven theses. This is great. In a, in a, in a, in a world that's identity is, you know, Cons preoccupied with identity, everybody's confused. Did anybody, anybody happen to read what they're doing in San Francisco now, the new law that he just put in? The mayor of San Francisco, the city council, they've instituted a new law and a new opportunity for trans people living in the streets. They're gonna pay them $1,200 a month, and anybody can get that $1,200 a month, so it's like a, a basic income so they don't have to work or anything like that. And so they have a list of everybody. I went on the website for the city today. I printed it out, but I won't. I think it's in my bag, but it had 97 genders on there. Mm -hmm. And everybody who fits one of those genders is qualifies for the $1,200 a month from the government. And the list of the 97, it's just like humanity is losing its mind. And they're celebrating like we're good, we're so good, we're so moral. Look what we're doing, we're rescuing all these people and, and, and it's affirming total unreality and insanity. It's absolutely crazy. And it's incentivizing darkness, okay? Now, why did I say that? Listen to Aquinas. So here he's talking about a Christian understanding of, of man. First, the first of the seven is the Christian is one who in faith becomes aware of the reality of the triune God. You know where we're going with this, right? So the first one is faith. We come to know through God's help who God is. God is the ground of all reality. Number two, the Christian strives in hope for the total fulfillment of his being in eternity. Christian hope. Number three, the Christian directs himself in the divine virtue of love to an affirmation of God and neighbor that surpasses the power of natural love. So the theological virtues, as you guys know well, faith, hope, and love. Now this is where it gets interesting for our talk tonight. Fourth, the Christian is prudent. Namely, he does not allow his view on reality to be controlled by the yes or the no of his will, but rather he makes this yes or no of the will the de dependent on the truth of real things. There's a mouthful. Right there? You, you get the point he's starting to get at. What is prudence? And prudence is the mother of all the virtues. Why? Because prudence does what? You're shaking your head, Deacon. Why? It's knowing when to use the virtue when. Yeah, virtue when. And why, why is that the God? Why is that the mother? Why does, the, why does hey, why does prudence have that, that ability to know when? Like, what about prudence allows us to effectively do what you just said? Go ahead. Anybody? Give it a shot. Anybody? It's grounded in reality. It's grounded in reality, right? So he's saying what the prudent man does is he gazes upon reality. Why? Because the reality is the revelation of being, the ground of all reality. There's no moral norm, he'll tell us, that is not rooted in the being of things, in reality itself. Truth is the correspondence to reality, right? And, and prudence is the, is the virtue, the habit, that has part of its characteristic a kind of interior silence to be able to not impose my will on reality, but to allow reality to speak to me. And then with my reason, I can grasp it. And with my will, I can say yes to it, and I can become a moral man. Right? I can say yes to what is good, the pursuit of the good. And the good is revealed in what is. Right? And so what, what he's saying is his prudence doesn't exercise the will first and say, I'll decide what it is. So look what's happening all around the culture. And he makes the point, building on Aquinas, it's impossible to live morally without being able to be in accord with reality. No matter how passionate you are, no matter how virtuous you think you are, no matter how courageous you think you are, it's impossible, it's impossible to be courageous 
in, in any true sense of the term if you're not directly relating to reality itself and acting upon the truth of real things is what he's saying. Does that make sense? A few guys are nodding. So what do we see in our culture today? My truth, my reality, it's the, it's the massive exercise of human will. That's why it's insanity. It's disconnected from unreality. So now the government is saying, yes, all 97 of you genders, all you people, this is your truth, this is your reality. This is what, and they, they accept it that way, right? So we now are acknowledging as a culture, whatever someone says about themselves and defines themselves, we have to recognize it. So we're suppressing the truth about God. And whether people do it consciously or not, that I'm suppressing the truth about God, many of them don't. But they're in a culture where the mind refuses to be subject, or the will to be subject to the truth about God. It's living Romans 1. And the madness of Romans 1 is unfolding. And what that happens is we become ever more perverted, ever more disordered, and we more and more find ourselves um, falling deeper and deeper into sin and celebrating habit patterns of sin. So that's prudence. Then he goes on. The fifth is the Christian is just. That is, he's able to live with others in truth. He sees himself as a member among members of the church, of the people, and of any community, right? That's justice. You, you give to one that is their due. You recognize the humanity of the person, and you act justly toward them. Number six. Now, here we go. It's a nice theme. The Christian is brave. That is, he's prepared to suffer injury, if need be, even death for the truth and for the realization of justice. Courage is the willingness to sustain a wound in defense of what's true and what's just. It's the willingness that's at, at its core. That's what it is. Right? To the point of being willing to die for it. And here's some things that um, Pieper describes about it. Or here, I'll read this paragraph. You guys, since you study philosophy, this, this is good. He goes, he reminds us, he's, oh, I forgot about number seven. Seven is, is temperance, right? Be temperate, namely, not to permit the desires to possess something or the desire for the pleasure to become destructive and inimical to my being, which is, again, happening all over the culture. By the way, I just had a conversation. Here's an example. I just had a conversation with one of the main leaders of Focus. I've known... Curtis Martin and I are friends. We've known each other for a long time. And one of the things, they, they did a deep dive study over the last few years of, of men in focus who are coming to their Bible studies. Guys, they're discipling. Something like 92% of the guys who are in the Bible studies, who they're evangelizing, have a problem with pornography. I said, I don't believe that. What? That many? I don't, I don't hardly believe it. And then that's the data. That's the data they actually have. And, and this is important for courage in relationship to courage because, because sexual sin and perversion weakens the interior silence, the kind of interior capacity to self-govern yourself, and it screws up your mind. It screws up your capacity to perceive the truth and have a right relationship in terms of awe, in terms of purity to the truth itself. You can't see it, you become blinded at a certain point. So you see the strategy of the devil that's at work to enslave people so they can't be courageous. If they, if they, and one of the things that steals courage is shame. You know, I know that from my, I, I confess, I mean, I know that from my own life, you guys, the mistakes I've made in my life. If I had fallen into some kind of sin like that in my life, I, it just steals your confidence. You feel shame, you kind of back up a little bit, right? And, and that's part of the devil's strategy is to enslave people. So you've got all kinds of young men now who are caught and trapped in this. And it's part of the devil's strategy to make it impossible for you to be courageous and zealous, right? Who am I, right? I'm, I feel scared, I'm insecure. What if somebody finds out, blah, 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 blah. You know, I don't even want to go to confession. I gotta go, I don't want to go, but I gotta go, you know? And, and you have all this trouble inside and your interior life is weakened. And the way he would talk about it so clearly is you can't see because you're blinded by these things because the devil's trying to shame you and steal what belongs to you, right? 
He said, all duty is based on being. Reality is the basis of ethics. And goodness is the standard of all reality. That, that's, that's so inspiring, isn't it? Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> all right, just a couple more things from Peeper, and then I, then I want to get some stuff from the Lord, from Scripture. But here's how he summarizes our relationship to the truth. Why prudence, having that right disposition, having inter, interior freedom to be able to see the truth as it is and to will it with God's grace is critical. That's what prudence helps us do, make the right choices. Here he says, to be open to the truth of real things and to live by perceived truth, these constitute the essence of a moral person. So before you can be courageous, you have to be able to see things in truth as they are and accept them that way, right? And to act on that perception. Only the one who sees and affirms this objective reality is also able to recognize how deeply the, uh, that ruin penetrates that an unjust, unchaste heart allows to happen to him or herself. Right? So it's an obstacle to living bravely. So when you're tempted in these areas, put as many things before yourself that say, this is attractive as it looks like to me, this temptation. Um, this is how it destroys me. Boom, 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 boom. You know? It's going to take away my courage. You know? And I'll tell you what, I've known lots of priests over the years, guys who stumble on occasion and say, but if I, if I stumble, I have a hard time getting up on Sunday morning. And I especially have, in, in preaching, I especially have a hard time getting up and saying the truth that could be hard for people because I'm like, who am I to say? You know? And it just undermines. And the devil wants to steal that capacity and the courage to stand up and give to the people what they need. Okay. Um, courage is characterized by patient endurance. Patient endurance. This is a fundamental posture of a Christian. And today I'm talking to Christian men. Patient endurance. That is, in the midst of great trial, what remains in me in patience is a kind of interior um, quiet, an interior security. It allows me not to be alarmed or to be shaken, you know, to be so that I don't end up giving into the fear that's present when I my life is threatened. So courage is the willingness to sustain a wound. Courage is operating only when the perception is that there's a real threat to my being somehow here, you know. And so some people are unable to handle it. And they run away from what would be a just and true and good act. For example, you know, guys, have you seen Hacksaw Ridge? You guys know that movie? You know the guy, how, you know, here he was. You know, he was a medic, uh, didn't have any weapons, and he's climbing up there. And that guy, he knew, and he says, what true courage is, I know, I see it as it is. It's an evil. The, the object, that wounding is an evil that, that's confronting me right now. And I know that I could be hurt and damaged by this. Seriously. So then what's natural is for fear to rise in me. So the question is then, am I, what am I going to do? The just man, uh, the prudent man, grasps what the dynamics. He grasps the threat that's in front of him, that it's real. But then he understands, what, is, what does the good demand of me now? What does a good man do? What's the moral thing for me to do? Is I need to summon the strength that's there. And I need to step right into the fire. So he's a radical image of it, you know. So he's got all these wounded guys. He's going to help. And he's walking right into the fire. You know, the bullets are flying. They're coming right at him. It's a good, it's a good example of, and why is he doing that? Because he, he knows what's demanded of him morally in the moment, right? I don't, I, I don't want to be a coward. And what, what happens is you can, what he says is that, um, what is it, Revelation chapter 12. Who's being, the martyrs are being celebrated in heaven, right? They're the ultimate heroes, the courageous ones. And their incense is going up before the altar, and they're being, and the angels are wowed by them. The whole, you know, they're being celebrated for all eternity. What does it say? They, how did they conquer the devil? They conquered the devil through what? The blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even unto death. Right? In other words, turn that around. 
They didn't love their life in such a way that they lost it. Courage is what helps us never do that. You know what I'm saying? Because you can inordinately love yourself. You can have a wrong kind of love where you're, you know, love of God, love of neighbor, love of self. They're, dis, they're disoriented. And you have, you're dominated by fears and insecurities and you're used to being, you know, saying yes to whatever, you're, you know, you want inside. And these moments come up and courage is what allows us to be able to subdue all that stuff to seeing the good and doing the good and remaining calm. Like think of Thomas More, you know, in his beheading, that famous scene. What did he say? Remember what he said? The guy was about to chop his head off, you know, and he's calm as can be. He's the calmest guy there. And he said, um, I die his majesty's good servant, but God's first. And then he blessed the guy, and the guy cut his head off. You know? Isn't that amazing? He was calm. This is, what, this is what converted Rome. The martyrs in the early church. Women, men, young people, who like, the, the testimonies came forward. You can find them, uh, martyrologists have written about it, where they say their calm, their joy, and the fact that they forgave us. They just couldn't understand it. There's just nothing in the pagan world like that, right? And they had, part of what was operating there was courage. And all the virtues help each other. And what virtue was really helping them and their courage in that moment was hope. What's hope? The confident expectation of the fulfillment of my life. I see through faith, the man who sees through faith, I see my future in the resurrected humanity of Jesus Christ. I see the victory. Death does not have a hold on me. Death does not reign over my life. I don't have to be afraid of sin and death. The devil wants to accuse me of my sins are forgiven. So death has no power over me, which means, right? So I have nothing to fear. And now this terrifying thing is not terrifying for me anymore on a certain level, right? And that's what courage with hope and faith and, and ultimately love is operating in us. Right? And the manly virtues of courage and zeal, I think, are, are things you guys would be just good for you guys to talk about and pray through. Because these things, I've, they're missing in the church in many places today. It's the rare leader who really is walking with that confident courage and full of zeal and not afraid of the world. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal, you know? And we have to be able to, to realize that. And one of the things to do in preparation for it, you guys, is while you're here, is just put all your cards on the table. You know what I mean? Just with guys you can trust in your spiritual, you know, I know there's internal and external, you're not supposed to get those confused, the forms and all that. But whoever's caring for your soul, you know, the people that say, one thing I'm determined to be, the, the people who have been assigned by God to care for me, they're going to know everything about me. I'm, I'm just going to tell them what I'm afraid of, what I'm ashamed of, what, you know, I, and I'm going to say, I, I know the Lord wants me to get healed while I'm here, not just to get my head on right or to get the tools to be a priest. He wants to heal my soul. So I have these healthy realities moving in me. And I don't have to be afraid when I'm out there. And I don't have to be afraid when I'm alone. And I don't have to be afraid of things that people get afraid of. And we look for, we look for ways to soothe ourselves or to secure ourselves or to avoid being scared or being alone and all that kind of stuff. Get it out. Talk about it. And, and let, that, let the Lord get at that stuff. To me, that's even more important almost than the academic stuff. You know, you know I, that's important too. I love all that. But, but it's critical to have that inside so you know thyself. You know yourself, you know, and you don't, you don't want to step out there, you guys, without having really honestly opened up and honestly worked through it and, and allowed the Lord to touch you and heal you. Because just the fact that you're weak doesn't disqualify you. You know, weak love is not false love, right? God knows your frame. He knows my frame. We're weak and broken human beings. That's who he chooses. He's got nothing else to choose from. That's literally true, right? And it's his strength in us, right? And it's his strength in the Christian at work. It's not like, ah, oh, I finally became, and, you know, I have this, you know, I'm just a courageous person. Now, some people happen to have a disposition that's more ordered to courage. Most human beings don't. But natural strength isn't going to do it either in the end. He gave you power. He said, I gave you a spirit of power and love and self-control. I didn't give you a spirit of timidity. Two stories. One, um, I was giving a retreat for priests out in New Jersey about 18 years ago. 
And uh, I'm, one of the themes was on some of this paper stuff, you know? And uh, there was about, I don't know, 35 guys there, all ages. And uh, I was talking about courage and how uh, this, this, um, yeah, that the basic disposition for all of us, uh, especially leaders in history, in this time between the two comings of Jesus, is fundamentally a battlefield. It's like, you know, the book of Revelation chapter one, John says, he's, about to, he's writing a letter to the seven churches. And he says, I, John, share with you the tribulation, the kingdom, and the patient endurance. This is Christianity in history. I share with you tribulation. This is trial. Jesus said, you know, in this world, you're gonna have tribulations. Be of good cheer, because I've overcome. And he said, I'm sharing with you this persecution that we're under. Number one, he didn't say, let's get out of here. Let's run from it. Let's compromise with the senator. He said, this is what we share, and I'm your shepherd, and I'm sharing with you. But I also share with you the kingdom. The king is on the throne. The king is in our hearts. He's empowering us. He's making it possible for us to live. So let's patiently endure the trials that we face, right? This is something that we, we really need to develop. So part of the whole witness in the whole book of Revelation and other letters as well talk about how the Christian conquers these powers of the world. And it said, the central calling that we have is to be witnesses. Jesus is the faithful witness. Firstborn from the dead, ruler of the kings of the earth, he was faithful to the end. He witnessed to the truth. He did justice to God the Father. He did justice to his neighbor. He looked death in the face. He, with calm, he witnessed to the truth, and he died, right? That's our, that's our model. And so this, this, this whole idea, what's the alchemy of the Christ, living out the Christian life? To give courageous, faithful witness to the truth of the gospel, to the words and works of Jesus in an unbelieving and increasingly hostile world. That's your mission. That's my mission. But you're a particular leader in it. Want me to read that to you again? To give courageous witness, courageous, faithful witness to the truth of the gospel, to the words and the works of Jesus in an unbelieving and increasingly hostile world. The world's going to hate you because it hated me. The day's coming. Jesus said. I mean, when you is there any other movement in the history of the world? I brought it along, you guys. You guys probably have seen, you know, seen this of how all the apostles died. You know, if you go on Wikipedia. I mean, literally, the, the band, the original band, the brothers. He said, they're going to kill you for me. They're going to unjustly kill you. Because they hate you and they hated me first. Because they don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want the reign of God. And it's amazing that whole, find another group in history where every single one of the guys that was in the inner circle that built the whole movement, the leader said, I'm going to be crucified, and all of you too, you're going to be persecuted, and you're going to die for me. All but John. John's the only one who, who wasn't, you know, either crucified, filleted, you name it. And they understood it. I mean, before they got baptized in the Spirit, you know, on Pentecost, before they were filled with the Spirit, they were under fear. But when they received the Spirit that gave them freedom, that allowed them to, to really believe in the exalted you know, status of Jesus, and that he was truly with them like he said, they experienced the power of the Holy Spirit then to be courageous, faithful witnesses. And then, I think this is, this is uh, just amazing to see, but the, the fundamental alchemy there is faithful suffering witnesses. This is normal Christian life. I mean, what we've lived in the United States has been like, like on easy street. It's like Disneyland for, for decades and decades and decades, and now the culture's shifting. And, the, and it's, we're not just, it's not, trust me, guys, it's not just a little blip we're living through, and we're going to get a couple politicians to get us back on board. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The whole Western world has rejected the gospel pretty much. Governments, government powers, the powers that be. Sir, you can find individuals. The churches, I mean, 
I'm going to Ireland in a few months. The church in Ireland, the great church in Ireland is collapsing. I mean, it's unbelievable what's going on in the West. So we are chosen for this time. This is a time it's going to cost leaders. It's going to cost you. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's not going to be the case where everybody, wow, there's a priest, wow, awesome, hero, fantastic guy, isn't he great? Some of that's going to happen. But the guys in Ireland, the priests I talk about, they don't even wear their clerics in the public anymore. They get spit on, they get cursed, this kind of stuff. Lots of priests don't. One of the main leaders from Ireland was here a couple of years ago. He came to talk to us about evangelization and stuff. And I asked him, how's the esprit de corps? And he described it to me. And I thought, wow. So it's a world they've not quite experienced. But we should not be surprised. This is exactly what Jesus said would happen. So it's important for us to know what we're signing up for and to know how he's equipped us with the gifts to be able to be a faithful witness to him to the end. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, so two examples, these guys in Jersey. So I'm giving a talk and I said, you know, one of the things that's critical, you guys, is you get readings every Sunday. Don't skip the hard readings, right? There's readings about what Paul says about marriage. People don't like that today. There's things Jesus says that are very hard to listen to. Some people say, well, I just want to hear the loving things of Jesus. I say, look, friend, Jesus never said a word that wasn't pure love, okay? His, his time in the temple was love. The hard sayings of Jesus are the truth. So don't tweak it. Don't edit the mail. But trust it and speak it with confidence. Don't, don't judge people and say, all of us are under the word of God. So I'm sharing this stuff, and this guy raises his hand and goes, you know, I, I, I just don't think you're right. I, don't, I just don't think we can do it right now. And so what do you mean? He goes, well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an associate pre pastor in this really, really wealthy parish in Connecticut. You know, very high-end, Wall Street, movers, shakers. Most people are afraid of people like that. You know what I mean? Because they got money and they got power and they're super confident and they make big donations and all that kind of stuff. And he said, you know, if I, if I said, for example, I talked about talking about once a year, talk about birth control once a year. You know, talk about abortion on occasion. Give the churches teaching on these things that are in the culture. Talk about same-sex marriage and this guy wasn't an issue back 18 years ago. But talk about these things. As a good pastor, teach the faith, you know. And he goes, look, there's four or five of those things. If I say them, I know some of those people are going to leave. I know them. I know they're going to leave. And I said, yeah, so what? And he said, no, you don't know who they are. I said, I don't care who they are. I don't care if they have money. I don't care if they have power. Well, they talked to the bishop, and the bishop could be upset, you know, because their donations aren't going to be there. I said, look, you should fear God. Don't fear men. You know? So the next morning, when I said to him, I said, Father, honestly, uh, he said, I just, I just can't do it. I said, Father, if you're not willing to preach the word of God faithfully as it comes to you, from the heart with compassion, identifying with this is the same word that's on me that's on you you know what I mean it's not me super priest and you know without saying if you're not willing to do it get rid of your collar right now do not you must not have read the Bible because the Lord's word to teachers is very 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 strong and all he wants you to do is just deliver the mail just say what I said you know so the next morning is the last session. We come back and he's not there. You know? I'm like, ah, maybe I scared him away. I don't know. Nobody knew where he was. And, uh, and so we're talking about 15 minutes into it. And all of a sudden he comes walking in. He just comes walking in and he, he's got this look on his face. And he said, Peter, can I, can I talk for a few minutes? And I said, sure. What's up, Father? He goes, you know what? It was a hard day yesterday for me. I was like, this probably like guy. He goes, I couldn't sleep last night. He said, uh, I finally got out of bed at 3 in the morning and went downstairs and I laid in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And I've been there since 3. And he said, I said, he said at one point, I said, God, what's wrong with me? What a great prayer. 
What a great question. And I said, well, what did he say? He said, you guys, this is what I felt like he said. His name is Jim. He said, Jim, I love you, but you are a coward. And you're afraid of men. You can't be faithful to me if you're going to fear men and not fear God. And you could hear a pin drop in there. The priest talking to priest, man. When the priest talked to priest from the heart, it's like, wow. The impact. And he goes, I just want you guys to know I made a commitment to Jesus. And I'm going to preach the word of God as it comes every Sunday. And I'm not going to hold back. I'm just going to share. And I'm going to let the chips fall. Because the Lord's right. I'm afraid of the opinions of men. I want powerful people to like me. That's a deep, I just thought, what a great, I, I thought, Jim, you were worth all my time. What happened with you, it's worth everything, you know? And you're the best preacher so far on this retreat, right here, right now. With your honesty, from the heart to your brothers, you know? And of course, they all got me prayed over, they kept praying over it, you know? And it was the, it was the closest moment of, of the time. So, I, I've talked to many priests, I talked to bishops who said to me, Ah, I'm by nature, I'm intellectual, like what was I'm an intellectual, I love God, I'm a nurturer by nature, like I, I'm a shepherd, I hate conflict, I can't stand conflict, it's been with me my whole life, and it's a burden, you know, I said, Bishop, I love you, Game I love you, thanks for your honesty, you know, that's where the Lord gives us supernatural grace, to just say, okay, like in, in courage, I, it doesn't mean my fear, my fear, okay, I've seen the truth now, I've assessed the situation, now I'm going to summon courage and my fear is going to go away. No, you got, you get up and you walk right with, you might be shaken in your boots, you know, but to walk into a, a situation where you could lose your life. But that's courage, right? And it's the same thing for a, for a priest who's afraid of conflict and troubles in the parish and people are teaching false things or doing things that are really unhelpful. It's like, Especially you don't want to talk to that person. I mean, geez, you know, they're, they're loud and they're aggressive and ah, I don't want to do it. Hey, you might have to summon. Keep your calm. Be patient. What does justice demand? What's my responsibility? Kind of thing, right? Another quick story. And then, and then, I'm, then I'm done. I'm supposed to stop at... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 7.15. I stopped, I, really? I went beyond my time already. Oh, I'm sorry. Started. One more story. One more story. Okay, sorry. I thought you said 45. Did I go more than 45 minutes already? <laughs> Maybe it was 730. 730. 730. Okay. Wow. Okay. You don't have to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so my wife, Debbie, she works in youth ministry with girls for 30 some years. She's working with young girls. Very effective ministry going on. So she gets invited to go to a parish uh, outside of Ann Arbor, a little bit of ways, big parish. And uh, to, to speak to the confirmands of the parish, the parents of the confirmands, because they're going through the confirmation process and all the parents are there, and then the, the kids are with uh, somebody from their staff. So they asked her to give a talk on identity, you know, on Christian identity. You know, the lady, the DRE of the parish, had heard Debbie give, it, give this talk and loved it and said, this would be really great for parents who really strengthen the parents. So um, she gives this talk, and in the middle of the talk, she just said, you know, and you know, it's so important for us to reinforce for young people and support them in a Christian identity because the, the whole battle for identity is all over the place. And people are making these choices and telling kids, you need to define yourself along these. That's all she said about that. And she moved on. So they finished, and she said, had a time for Q&A. So I was at home that night, um, and she comes home from the meeting, and she comes downstairs, and I look at her, she looked like she saw a ghost. And I said, I said, Deb, what's going on? She goes, you should have been there. It was hard. I said, what, what happened? And she sat down and she goes, well, you know, I gave this talk and I've heard her give the talk. And it's just, it's just so non offensive. It's unbelievable. But anyway, so we had a Q&A. And a woman stands up in the back, raises her hand. And she goes, she stands up and looks at Debbie. She goes, I'm, I'm in the health department at the local public school. You are the most hateful person I've ever heard. And he's, she's shouting at her. You know, and Debbie's like, 
got scared, you know? And, um, and nobody's moving, right? And she's saying this to me, and she goes, and then Peter, and then, and then uh, she sat down, and I said, here, and then the other, another lady got up, and she was mad. And, and, and she goes, I said, what'd you say? She goes, I, I didn't really know what to say. I just, it was shocking. You know, I never experienced anything like that before. And I said, well, what did anybody else say? No one said a word. And I said, was, were there any men in the room? And she goes, yeah. She goes, if you're standing there, she goes, like, one guy, this one lady was yelling, I kind of looked, and uh, my eyes met with him, and he kind of put his head down. I said, no one said anything? No. That was the end of the Q&A. Wait a minute. i got to get this straight. Confirmation parents. Your kid's about to become a soldier of Christ? Ready for the battle? I mean, that's the language of the church. We use it for generations to become a full member of the church. Right? And you're in the house of God. This is not, you know, the, the quad at Michigan, you know? <laughs> this is the church. This is the house of God. And oh, I just thought, I, can't, I just can't believe it. And, I, and so the next morning, Debbie gets an email from the DRE. And she said, Debbie, I, I repent to you. I'm so sorry. When that woman started shouting, I froze in my seat. She said, I was shaking. And uh, please forgive me. Then we come to find out that this woman, the DRE, was called in to see the pastor because that lady had come and chewed out the pastor. Okay? So the pastor got upset. Then the pastor said, you write a letter to everybody who came and you apologize. He was more afraid of that woman than he was of firing his, his, D, his DRE and the consequences of that. She said she wouldn't do it. A year later, I'm at a wedding and a reception and the dance is going on. This big guy comes up to me. He goes, hi, Mr. Herbeck. And he shook my hand and he's kind of looking at me. He goes, hey, you know, I, I, got, I got to really talk to you. I got, I got to talk. I said, sure, what's up? You know, he goes, I, I got to repent to you. And I said, why? He goes, I was there the night your wife you know, took all that crap, and I did nothing. He said, I, I can't tell you how many times I've thought about it. And that grown man, he, standing, he, he, he started, a tear ran down his cheek. I'm not joking. He said, Mr. Herbert, will you please forgive me for not being a man, for not defending your wife, because she did not say one single thing that wasn't done with charity. It didn't come right from the scripture or catechism. Not one word. I said, yeah. You big chicken. No, I, didn't. I, said, yeah. <laughs> I, I, know, I said, I said, yeah, I forgive you, man. I get it. I understand it. Okay? So it would have been so easy for one person who just had the kind of poise, you know, like kind of the patient endurance to stand up and just say, hey, uh, you, hey, ma'am, thank you for sharing your thoughts. I, I just want to say for my two cents, I didn't hear anything from Mrs. Herbeck tonight that contradicted scripture and the catechism and I think it was really done in charity. And, um, you know, I think I'd advise you to you know, talk with the, the, the pastor or the bishop or something. And don't argue. Don't get in a big fight. But stand up and bear witness to the truth. You know, stand up and defend somebody. It's a small thing. But that kind of stuff is happening more and more within the church itself. Because why? Because people are formed by the culture more than anything. Right? And the culture is saying this is good. And this is legal. And this is good. And it should be defended kind of thing. Right? And so, um, I'll just end, I'll end there. Yeah. And let's just pray, pray a prayer, because we're going to take a little break, is that what we're going to do? Here, we're here. going to go straight into worship. Oh, great, yeah. great, great, great. Okay, good. But let's just say a little prayer. You can shuffle up there if you want, get your music going, yeah. if you like. Yeah. 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 Let's pray in the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we, we thank you so much for gift of your beloved son, the faithful witness, the definition of courage, firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge our weakness, we acknowledge our fears, we acknowledge the reality 
our own fallen nature, but we also know that you yourself have called us. You dwell in us, and you said, don't let your hearts be troubled, but believe in me. Lord, we believe in you. I pray for these good brothers. I pray for the anointing of your spirit to continue to increase in their life. I pray that you would help them become courageous witnesses, men filled with holy zeal and great prudence that they could walk in the truth and be conduits of grace for the sake of the salvation of the world and salvation of souls. In Jesus' name we pray. response uh, in, a, in a fitting way able to receive the gift that the Lord's trying to give us if anything stirred up in your heart you know please bring that to the Lord in this time as we offer him a worthy sacrifice of praise so brothers and sisters let's, let's stand up
Thank you. 
Okay, please take a seat. So I'm I'm really grateful for this evening. I think I think we received a little bit more of that more that the Lord has for each of us tonight. And, um, so let's remain in this place of uh, receptivity. It, we're going to take a quick break here. Uh, I've got a couple announcements, and then uh, we'll come back at. 810 for small group prayer. Um, is there a new uh, newcomers group? Is he yeah, over in uh, room one tag for Yeah, yeah. we're going to set the prayer meeting. We'd like to pray together and just kind of learn more about what we're doing. So go ahead and talk to Carl or uh, and, and Father Zach, maybe. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. Great. You'd be very welcome to join us for that. And uh, we'll have some prayer groups you know, here in this room as well. Um, so just three points. Uh, this is the final meeting of 2022. Um, and next year we're going to host uh, Patrick, Father Patrick Gagno uh, on Friday, February 17th. Um, and in the in the meantime, we might we 
might have the opportunity to do some smaller scale uh, prayer meetings for, for the seminarian community specifically. Um, but uh, yeah, our next, our next big prayer meeting like this uh, will be uh, next year. Uh, we're going to have a Life in the Spirit seminar here at the seminary, uh, and that's gonna be Saturday, February 4th. It's going to go all morning into the beginning of the afternoon, so 9.15 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. So it's like in uh, Formation Saturday on steroids. But it will be well worth it. It will be well worth it because we have uh, Father David uh, Kogut coming in, uh, who's a priest of the Diocese of Lansing and an alumnus of Sacred Heart Major Seminary. Uh, great priest, uh, Josh uh, Lennon, who's out there uh, serving with him this summer, and he can tell you all about Father Dave. Um, Goodness, I wrote. Yeah, I'm thinking of your. My pastor is Father David. Oh no! <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah, Father Dan. Oh shoot. Uh, so this seminar is going to be specifically oriented for uh, for seminarians. It's going to be on uh, you know, how they can how seminarians can discover uh, what living a charismatic life as a priest looks like and, uh, and receiving the spiritual gifts uh, that will bless those that they serve. So this is for, for the seminarians, and it's going to be a great gift. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Contact Josh or Randy uh, Kenningschneck if, uh, if you've got some questions about that. Finally, we are uh, at the Fellowship of St. Paul. We are small in numbers right now. Uh, all glory to God, he works with the small. I can, I can testify. He's <laughs> worked with the small. Um, and so at this point in time, uh, you know, we're, we're working on kind of figuring out what does the Lord have for us? And he's really blessed us thus far. I think each of us can testify uh, in, in various ways to what he's done in this, in this, uh, in this fellowship. So, um, but uh, that's to say it's also 100% 100% crowdfunded. And uh, as it stands, we've got mostly seminarians in the room. Uh, so I would encourage you, brothers, you know, even if it's your, your widow's might, uh, you know, please consider dropping something in that in that can back there. And everybody, if, if you've been blessed tonight, we especially like to be uh, generous with our speakers, uh, like Peter, who you know really do bless us. So please consider that. And uh, with that, uh, you've got you've got some minutes uh, until eight ten. What time is it? Uh, okay, eight fifteen. Uh, eight fifteen. We'll we'll start some small group prayer now. Room one ten. We're in here. Uh, okay, in break.